Hello, everyone, and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host, Stuart Blues, and this week I have another very special guest on the show. He's an award-winning journalist who's reported from more than 40 countries around the world over a period of 45 years. He's reported for the BBC, the Daily Telegraph, Daily Mail, and for 22 of those 45 years, he's reported for The Guardian. With eight books written today and two more scheduled for release in 2022, my guest this week is now a freelance writer and broadcaster. Please welcome to the show, Stephen Bates. Welcome, Steve. Hello, Stuart. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Okay. I hope I got all those facts right. I did steal them from your website, I must admit. (laughs) Yeah, that sounded pretty fair. Yeah. You've had a great, illustrious career from the looks of things. Your CV is stacked, I would call it. How did you actually get into the whole journalism thing? Oh, God. Well, that's, a, that's quite a long story. I, um, I went off to college, didn't do any student journalism, which was a mistake. When I left, I f- decided, I, I read history, and I decided that um, I quite liked journalism as a possibility and uh, applied to all the graduate trainee schemes that they used to be in those days and failed spectacularly to get onto any of them. My father said, you better come and work for the company I work for, which was a timber merchant. So I spent several months funneling bits of timber and planks into uh, saws in a sawmill on the south coast and um, thought, I will try again for journalism. And I happened to send off a CV the day someone at the Reading Chronicle handed in their notice. So um it meant the editor didn't have to interview anyone and I got the job and I did uh, three years training at uh, Reading and then a couple more years at Oxford and then I got a job at the BBC and the rest as you see is history. What does the training involve if you're a novice to journalism? Well I'm not sure that it's the same anymore um in those days it was like a medieval apprenticeship scheme you uh uh, signed on for two years, three years, had a probationary period, and then the newspaper, while employing you as a journalist, um, undertook to train you. So you had to learn things like shorthand in those days. That takes you back. And also journalism law and how to write stories, that sort of thing. Um, so that's what I did. And I found that I absolutely loved doing it, even flower shows and uh, golden wedding anniversaries on a local paper it was great fun and I met lots of people and uh enjoyed myself very much and Reading is a very good news area so there were lots of murders deaths trials all those sorts of things and you got to do those in those days and then you take a proficiency test at the end and if you pass which fortunately I did with a little help um you're free to go yeah Do you tend to start on the lesser known cases like, I say cases, I mean news stories, stuff like flower shows, the local little tidbits like reporter in the field kind of stuff. Do you get recognition on the back of that and then you get put on more, not notorious? Yes, well, you you have to start off by getting some of the basics, learning the basics, getting some of those right, like uh, spelling names correctly, that sort of thing. And making sure that you take down the details of who's won the best chrysanthemum or the best marrow. And um, from there, once you've mastered those very elementary details, you get taken on to do other more important and more exciting cases. That's what happened to me. And um, eventually I got onto a national newspaper. It took me uh, about five or six years, but um, I had a diversion onto the BBC first when I was young and slim and um, do reporting on camera. (laughs) What's the transition like from sort of more regional news to national? Do they sort of poach you? Do they see your work and think, oh, we'll have him? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I think I'm so old. I think it happens a lot less in those, uh, in these days, but yeah, they um, hear of, uh, a likely lad and uh, either you're applying to them or they're um, seeking you out. I had a bit of both of those so um, that's how I got my first 
job on the Telegraph when um, I'd been working for the BBC. And, uh, of course, working for television and, and radio as I was is a bit different from written journalism, but um, not so hugely. And uh, I, I switched over to Telegraph. And then, indeed, I was poached by the Daily Mail, who um, in those Fleet Street days when they, all the newspapers were close together, they hear of people who were unsatisfied or dissatisfied and wanted to move on. And uh, if they liked the look of you, they'd um, offer you a job. And that's what the Daily Mail did. What's it like when it comes to editing an article you've written? So I, I'm assuming they all have editors, but how many editing processes does it go through, especially if there's a deadline? If you want to get it out for tomorrow, let's say, what's the back and forth like? Again, that's changed hugely over recent years. Yes, I mean, the, the classic way is uh, you write the story, it goes to a sub-editor who uh, checks the facts, checks the grammar, checks the spellings of the names, cuts the story if necessary to fit on the page, and then uh, it, it uh, goes off to the printers. It's a bit different now because it's all um, online and uh, social media and all that sort of stuff. So there's a much more urgent um, passage of uh, news writing, much more frequent updating than there was in the old days. Have you ever had a big bust up with an editor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Over the years, mainly on the Daily Mail, it has to be said, because... Uh, they were much more interventionist about stories, funnily enough. Um, for instance, the more laissez-faire Guardian was. And mm. um, so, yeah, if a uh, story didn't stand up in their terms, there was a tendency to try and make it stand up, which wasn't always either fair, accurate or ethical, in my opinion, at the time. So what's the view on sort of sensationalist media and clickbait articles all that kind of stuff that's prevalent these days well it's uh, in a way it's something that's always happened on newspapers even in the written editions of um uh years ago uh, you know the idea is to get the most sensational take on the most sensational story to get people uh, to get people reading it and uh that's the same as it was a hundred years ago my mother best part of a hundred years ago now always used to remember a newspaper vendor shouting out um man kicked to death by spiders which is clearly not true but certainly clickbait and um people would buy the newspaper just to find out if it was true and of course it wasn't <laughs> but by then they've paid their penny yeah or whatever it was in those days well that's the key thing i suppose it's getting the the eyes on the prize as it were is there a danger, though, of some people wanting to be known as the first one that reported it rather than necessarily fact-checking it? Well, you're in trouble if you don't fact-check stories because you open yourself up to possibilities of legal action and you get the thing that all journalists hate being corrected in print. And so, yeah, you can certainly be first. Everyone wants to be first. Everyone wants the scoop. But it had better be right, especially if you're out ahead of the pack. Otherwise, um, you get into trouble, the story gets devalued, and the newspaper doesn't like you very much. Yeah. Just sort of a question. I'm not sure how much it applies to British media, but every time I watch an American TV show, they mention something called Sweeps Week. Have you I don't know it? that word. Have you not no, heard I don't. It? I wondered if you'd heard of it. I'm not sure what it is. It's clearly not relevant in the UK, which is absolutely uh, <laughs> No, I mean, American journalism tends to be much uh, more serious and dour and um, takes itself much more seriously, I think. And uh, that doesn't always make for the most interesting property. Yeah. So what point did you decide to transition then from, because you're still a journalist at the moment, you still write articles. I do. Um, I decided um, to get out while the money was good. I've always wanted to write books. So I'd started writing a couple of books before, before I, I left the paper. But I thought it would give me more space and more scope to write what I wanted to do and to do the sort of things I wanted. So it's proved I've uh, now written 
10 books, eight published, two, two on the stocks, and um, it's a nice life. Not as well paid, but it's not a nicer life. More freedom, I imagine. Yeah. So of those eight that are published so far, on your website it says seven of those are non-fiction, one of those is fiction. Take it from that, you prefer the non-fiction side to fictional? Was that sort of dipping your toes in the water? Oh, yeah. Um, the fiction book is um, a story out of the American Civil War, which I found very interesting at the time. It was a, it's a book called The Photographer's Boy, which you can still get online, I suspect. And it was about how American Civil War photographers, and there were such people in those days because photography had already been invented, and they carted their big box cameras on tripods and uh, uh, with capes to cover their heads um, around the battlefields of the Civil War. And uh, everyone knew that had happened, but what they hadn't realized was that uh, the photographers had been quite artful in um, making their images more interesting than they might otherwise have been. And the thing that uh, absolutely fascinated the American audiences was photographs of dead people on battlefields sort of things really we don't publish these days but the Americans in the 1860s were fascinated by dead bodies and there was a case of a dead confederate at Gettysburg whose body was moved by the photographer 50 yards presumably dragged 50 yards to make a, a, a better shot and no one had spotted that this body had evidently been moved for about 100 years afterwards. So this was, uh, I, as an old journalist, I found this fascinating because everyone knows that uh, the camera never lies. Well, from the very earliest days of the camera, uh, photographers were lying. I found that fascinating. So I wrote a fictionalized book about it. Um, and it did quite well, especially in the States. But it's not something I have found um, a suitable subject for to write a fiction book again and I'm probably happiest and most secure in doing books about history, books about current affairs, that was my job after all for a long time and true crime is one of those niche areas that particularly fascinate me. Do you find it more challenging to do the fictional work because that is you're starting from a blank canvas it's all in your head Whereas the, the historical stuff, the stuff that's happened, you have a little bit of a basis to start from? Yes, I think that's right. Um, I did find writing the um, fiction book much more challenging and much more difficult than uh, any of the other books about true things that happened. It's a difficulty you find just getting people to walk across a room, you know, and uh, you don't have to bother with that sort of thing in a, a non-fiction book a lot of your books are historical from what i've seen i take it that's quite a big passion of yours history in general is there a specific time period you're most fond of yes i mean I, i'm very interested in modern history that was the subject of my degree so anything from uh, the georgian period upwards really and onwards um i'm very interested in the sort of late modern period. My latest book is about a, a crime in the 1920s. And the 1920s and 30s are interesting to me, um, not least because my parents who are both dead, uh, were growing up in that period. So I feel it's almost within touching distance, but not quite. I, a lot of the manners and customs and attitudes of a hundred years ago were very different from today and indeed sometimes almost inexplicable and I think that makes it more fascinating because they're modern, they went to the cinema, they played records uh, and went to sporting events and all those sorts of things but it was a very different life, different uh, standards of living, different uh, currency uh, in many respects and um, if you committed a crime, you went to court, and if it was a murder, you were hanged at the end of it. Now, I'm just old enough to remember 
uh, the last hangings which took place in the 1960s before capital punishment was uh, abolished in this country. And even as a small boy, um, there was a very strange and heavy atmosphere on the days when those executions took place. I mean, I, obviously I wasn't uh, remotely involved in it, but one was aware of a very heavy atmosphere and that's stayed with me and it's uh, a, a sense and a feeling that you don't get even with the most gruesome murders these days because um, people disappear into prison for the rest of their lives or a large part of their lives anyway and um, so the cases have lost a bit of their tension and a bit of their extraordinary pull of uh, lawyers defending a man or woman fighting for their lives and no the barristers knowing that one question out of place could uh, settle a man for death or reprieve and um, that must have been a pressure of the sort you can't imagine today it's an interesting point that actually i'd never thought of it like that arguing nowadays is because mandatory sentence for murder is life quote-unquote life with a minimum term to serve i suppose the only thing they're arguing for now is the minimum sentence and i'm aware i looked on the crown prosecution's website a few weeks ago and it gave a brief sort of a high level overview of the minimum sentencing for judges like 15 years 20 years 25 30 etc do you think well, I guess the, the most easy way I can form this question is, do you think death penalty is missed? Do you think it's something that should potentially be brought back? No, not in the least. I absolutely oppose to capital punishment on both moral grounds. I don't think it's right to take someone else's life in that way. And on pragmatic grounds, because you might get the wrong person. And when capital punishment was eventually abolished in the 1960s, there have been several notorious cases where people had been hanged. And of course, there's no coming back from being hanged. And it was later found that they'd been wrongly executed and shouldn't have been executed. And so I think the possibility of getting it wrong is a, a considerable disincentive to the death penalty. I can't think that it will ever be brought back. At least I sincerely hope it won't be. I agree. I, I disagree with it. I think it's good that it's not there anymore. I suppose, like you say, someone could be a lackey, a fall guy, take the fall. For, I know it's a life versus a prison sentence, but back in the day, I suppose you never know what could have happened. And then once that's occurred, you move on with the case and someone potentially is walking free. You did mention your latest book, which is coming out as of today when this episode is published, April 7th. And it's The Poisonous Solicitor, the true story of a 1920s murder mystery. I like how you mentioned that this is a sort of era, you know, you mentioned your parents there. Is it quite comforting writing in this period of time for that reason? I think it's a very interesting period. The uh, particular case that I'm writing about in The Poisonous Solicitor happened exactly 100 years ago, almost to the day involved a chap who'd been away in, in the First World War. There were quite a few uh, capital cases of people who'd fought in the First World War. It was such a great dislocation of society. And society was changing very rapidly. And uh, it was um, something that infused sort of modern life with uh, a sort of new freshness and a sort of hedonism, you all know about the Roaring Twenties, that didn't apply to large swathes of uh, England in those days. But, you know, people, women were starting to wear shorter skirts, they were starting to be more liberated, and men too had uh, gone through this awful experience of the First World War, and they wanted a different life, they didn't want to go back to the farm Remember, there's a famous song of the First World War called How You're Going to Keep Them Back on the Farm Once They've Discovered Paris. So things were changing. Things were loosening up. Some things 
was staying the same. And this murder took place right at that crux point. So what can you, well, obviously not without giving too much away, because, you know, I want people to go out and read your new book. What's the sort of overarching story with regards, I believe it's a major Herbert Armstrong's the protagonist villain, however you want to describe him in this book. Yes, uh, he's the only solicitor ever to be hanged for murder in this country. And he was a little small town solicitor. He was literally a small chap. He was only five foot six. And he was accused and tried for poisoning his wife. And a considerable doubt remains over whether he was really guilty or not. He had a very unfair trial. But there are certain strands which I go into in the book which suggest that maybe there was a correct verdict, but maybe not. After 100 years, it's very difficult to tell. He was a little punctilious man and he, he came back from the First World War to find that his wife was suffering pretty clearly from a nervous breakdown. She suffered quite badly from nerves. She was highly strung. And although the couple had three children, there were evidently strains in the marriage. She got, her behaviour got more and more difficult to, to control. And she was sent off to uh, an asylum for a medical uh, asylum for treatment and came back and was not really cured and became more and more depressed and manic. And within a few weeks of her release back to the family home at Aon Wai, which is a little town on the border of Wales and England by the Brecon Beacons, a very remote spot in those days, much less so these days. Within a month of her being released from the asylum, she died. And no one thought that was particularly strange or odd. The local doctor issued a death certificate because he'd been treating her and uh, he thought she died of natural causes and the major was clearly rather distraught and he went off to um, have a holiday a breakaway in the on the continent and came back and he was getting to be quite friendly with a woman he'd met during the war and they began to speak to each other about possibly getting married and he, at the same time, back in Heon Wai, he was getting into a rather aggravating dispute with the other solicitor in town who had the, opposite, uh, the office opposite him. And the other solicitor was representing, it was a, it was a dispute over property uh, sales and conveyancing, which is not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, but the major was representing a landowner and the other uh, solicitor, Oswald Martin, was representing tenants of his who wanted to buy his estate or buy their farms on his estate. And it got uh, fractious and, and difficult. And the major suggested that um, Martin should come over for, for tea. And they had this uh, tea party at the major's house, during the course of which Martin said that the major passed him a scone in his fingers saying excuse fingers this was the most uh, extraordinary thing because it wasn't the sort of thing the major would normally do at all and he ate it and he went home and he had supper and then he became violently ill he was sick for several days but then he got better and his father-in-law was the local chemist who said I remember selling Major Armstrong some arsenic. I wonder if he's trying to bump you off. <laughs> and they discussed this with the local doctor who was a friend of the Major's and uh, the doctor thought about it and decided that actually, yeah, that might have been, yeah, the symptoms of Martin and come to think of it, the symptoms of Mrs. Armstrong, who was by that stage 10 months in her grave, were remarkably similar to the symptoms for arsenic. She was uh, unearthed and uh, the Home Office sent down their top pathologist and they found quite a lot of arsenic in her body. So the Major was put on trial. 
for attempting to poison Oswald Martin, but mainly, of course, for murdering his wife. He had the means, he had the opportunity, and he had the arsenic. And he was subjected to a difficult trial where he was up against, or his barrister was up against, the top pathologist, the top toxicologist in the country, who were both absolutely convinced that uh, he had poisoned her. They didn't have much access to the latest theories of um, how arsenic kills someone, and there's a considerable doubt about um, whether she was poisoned by her husband, whether she wanted to commit suicide, bearing in mind she was depressed, or whether she had taken some of the arsenic um, by accident. He had arsenic in the house because uh, he said he used it for weed killer because he had dandelions all over his lawn. And indeed, he seems to have been prodding arsenic down into the roots of dandelions to uh, get rid of them. So the big trial, it was a, a huge story at the time. It was reported as far away as uh, America and Australia. Edgar Wallace, the great uh, novelist of the day, went down to report it for the Daily Mail. And Major Armstrong was found guilty and was executed and hanged. And uh, that was the end of that. Everyone thought he got his just desserts. But it was only many years later as people started to look at the, uh, the case in some forensic detail that uh, doubts uh, have arisen over whether he really was guilty or not. So he might have been a case of someone who was hanged in error. But the case in the meantime was uh, extremely influential in the careers of Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and various other detective story writers. It was the period when they were just starting to write their first novels. And indeed, some of their novels not only have a similarity to uh, what happened in the Armstrong case, uh, as you probably know, Agatha Christie um, was very keen on murders by arsenic. And several of their stories, Dorothy Sayers and Agatha Christie, mention either explicitly or implicitly the Armstrong case in, in various of their plots. The fact that the Armstrong case was a true life example of a sort of who done it. Um, two people in conflict in a little market town, remote part of England, poison, poison not being suspected and then being discovered to be the cause of death. All those things contributed to the fact that this story got immense publicity and has on and off ever since. Wow. Why was something as hazardous as arsenic readily available back in those days? Because there's so many cases from back then. I've covered a few on, on the podcast a little bit later than early 20th century, but I've got Graham Young, I've covered the teacup poison. That wasn't arsenic, that was antimony, thallium. Mary Wilson, Sarah Dasley, I think it's pronounced. Mary Ann Cotton, all these people using arsenic or some kind of poison back in the day. What was it actually marketed for, arsenic? It, well, it, it was easily available. Uh, you could go into a chemist's shop and buy it. They'd started to regulate it in the 1850s, but essentially, if you went into a chemist shop, you could buy a quantity of arsenic and you had to sign a book to say you'd bought it and when you'd bought it. And people used it as the major did to as a sort of weed killer um, and also as uh, to kill vermin, rats, mice, that sort of thing. So it had a, a legitimate use. But of course, as it was so easily available and as it was such a lethal um, poison, it was regarded with great suspicion. And the, the great thing about poison was it was insidious. You couldn't see it being administered. And that was really very shocking to people because there was still lingering expectation that you could sort of instinctively tell a murderer you could tell from how he how he looked, whether his eyes were too close together, from the bumps on his head, that sort of thing. But actually you couldn't. And poison was not only very cheap, 
and read readily accessible, but it tended to be the poison used by women, by professional people. An awful lot of doctors got um, done for poisoning people um, in the course of the 19th century. So you couldn't tell by looking. These people could be terribly respectable and yet they could be knocking you off insidiously and gradually and in great uh, pain and suffering. And that's why arsenic in particular, but also other poisons such as uh, strychnine were a source of great controversy. It took a long time for them to be banned. Nowadays, over the last 50 or 60 years, of course, you can't, you can't just walk into a shop and buy arsenic by the pound as you could in those days. And therefore the number of poisoning cases has dropped off entirely. I did a previous book about a 19th century Victorian poisoner, and I interviewed a couple of pathologists about the effects of poison. And one of them said, well, you have to realize you go through your whole career these days, never seeing a poisoning case because it's just so hard to get, get hold of. Yeah. I was going to ask with regards to signing the, like, I suppose a hazardous substance form, I guess, when you get the arsenic, was that just for specific substances? I take it that wasn't from everything you got from the chemist back then. No, no, no. It was a, it was called the poison's book. And so if, if you were sold uh, a poison, um, then you had to sign and I think say why you bought, bought it, which of course was easily something that could be evaded. But uh, it was very cheap too, which was a, an added uh, advantage or disadvantage. Arsenic uh, is about, about three grains of arsenic uh, required to kill someone. And that's about half the size of a paracetamol tablet. I mean, it's, it's, it is a very small amount, yeah. um, but you could buy it by the pound. Major Armstrong bought several pounds of it over the course of a number of a number of years to treat the dandelions on his lawn and it literally cost a few pence you could knock off someone for cost of a shilling or so it was a very lethal and potent uh, device and um, it had to be regulated and eventually they did slowly crack down on it did people assume that it wasn't traceable then is that why you think so many well that as yeah a there are symptoms and there are effects, but they could often be confused with something else. They were not necessarily obvious. You might get a very bad stomach ache, but then people do get bad stomach aches for no other reason than um, uh, they've eaten a bit of bad fish or something. So it's quite, you, you, you had to analyze and you couldn't tell by and large, while they were still alive. So that's what happened. And um, with luck, you'd get away with it if you were careful and um, crafty. I think many people did get away with it. Probably. Yeah. But who knows? How long does it stay in the human body, do you know? Because 10 months is obviously a fairly long time, especially if the body's decomposing. With it being a poison, does it, does it stay in, indefinitely? Or? Well, it, it, I think it event, eventually sort of ev evaporates or dissolves. But poor Catherine Armstrong had uh, taken such a large dose one way or the other that it was still in her stomach 10 months later. The specialists, the pathologists were, were asked this at the trial because she had been fed um, various tonic medicines while she was in the asylum, many of which actually contained arsenic, and arsenic is still used in some uh, medicines in very, very small quantities, obviously. As she'd been taking medicine at the asylum, and also she was keen on homeopathic medicines, some of which contained arsenic as well. The, at the trial, the uh, pathologists were asked whether that could have been, those things could have been the source of um, the poisoning. And they said, no, after six, six or nine months on a, in a living person, they're either pass, they've passed through the body 
um, and you might get traces in the fingernails and in the ends of the hair, but otherwise you wouldn't necessarily notice it. So when the person has died, there is a residue in the stomach or perhaps in one of the other organs. But with a live patient, someone who's still alive, after a little bit, it passes away. It passes out through the body. Yeah. It's quite interesting to think that if you want to top someone off with arsenic and they do pass away, the arsenic remains in the body. But if you get it wrong, it could, in theory, dissolve and dissipate. It's quite ironic, I think. <laughs> yes. Well, um, there are symptoms, but as I say, they're there is always a possibility that um, it's caused by something absolutely natural. And uh, arsenic is a white powder and it can be mistaken for other things. It could be mistaken for sugar or it could be mistaken for flour. One of the precautions that was taken in the 1920s was that it had to be coloured when it was sold, um, usually by charcoal to make it grey rather than white and so less likely to be confused with other things with other things but uh, it was tasteless so when you actually ate it or drank it in solution in um, your whiskey or whatever or a cup of tea you wouldn't know that you were taking something uh, particularly noxious. So you mentioned that with the attempted murder it was a scone that he passed to the gentleman and he's eaten that and he's become sick would he have, do you think, mixed the arsenic within the actual mixture of the scone or would he have sprinkled it on top? How, how do you think that would have worked? Well, it was never made clear. Um, the scones were almost certainly made by the housekeeper at his house. And of course, he denied absolutely that um, he he'd tampered with any of them. He could have potentially have sprinkled some on the top of the scone wouldn't necessarily show up, but uh, he vehemently denied anything to do with the scone and indeed had eaten some of the other scones himself. The particular purpose to the excuse fingers was deliberately passing a poison scone mm -hmm. on to uh, Oswald Martin. There was also a box of chocolates, which also caused a lot of furore when um, the case was first reported. Oswald Martin and his wife had um, received a box of chocolates in the post and they thought, oh, that was quite nice. Um, and they'd saved it up. And when Oswald's um, brothers and sisters came to stay for the weekend a few weeks later and they had dinner together, they brought out this box of chocolates. And one of the sisters was very ill afterwards. And when... Uh, the suspicions about what Armstrong might be doing came up. The box of chocolates was tested and found that several of them had been drilled into and white powder placed in them, which was arsenic. Wow. So this was a great sort of source of furore at the time and uh, lots of media coverage of that, lots of newspaper coverage, of course, the poisoned chocolates, uh, which went further to damn Armstrong. The only trouble was that. Um, no one knew who had actually sent them. So the chocolates themselves didn't form part of the ultimate court case, but they had been publicised so fully before then in the newspapers during the committal proceedings in AMY that everyone knew about the poisoned chocolates and this uh, wicked devious major, even though there was absolutely nothing to tie him to the chocolates. How hard is it to research a case from 100 years ago? Well, it was quite hard this time last year because of the pandemic and uh, lockdowns, which meant that a lot of the research libraries were closed, including the National Archives, which have uh, several files on the Armstrong case. And of course, it couldn't go down to Hay on Y. I live in Kent, couldn't go down to Hay on Y to uh, actually sniff out the lie of the land. Fortunately, my deadline was at the end of May and the restrictions, travel restrictions were lifted earlier in May. So I was able at the very end of my writing and researching the book to go to the National Archives, to go down to Hay and to go to particularly the office of 
Armstrong's solicitor, who, which was in Hereford, because he obviously employed another solicitor, a colleague of his, to represent him and to do the legal odds and ends of, uh, of the case. And um, 100 years on, that solicitor's firm is still in operation under the same name. And they have five boxes of documents, contemporary documents, press cuttings, statements, transcripts, letters, all sorts of things, which were obviously immensely uh, useful to me going through them and getting some insights of, about the case from them. On the wall beside me, as I was writing in one of their, uh, one of their meeting rooms, there's a picture frame on the wall with the letter that Armstrong wrote from Gloucester Prison to the solicitor to thank him on the on the afternoon before his execution. Thank you for doing all you've done for me. And below that is his pipe, which he also gave to the solicitor on his last afternoon as a memento. So on the wall of this solicitor's office, there's not only Major Armstrong's last letter, but uh, Major Armstrong's pipe. <laughs> and uh, the solicitor's firm website actually makes a small feature of the Armstrong case because it was so notorious. And one, uh, another solicitor said to me, how funny that they commemorate one of their biggest losses rather than <laughs> their successes, which was a bit unfair, but they were very kind to me and uh, that was very, very helpful. I also went to uh, see the office in Hay where Major Armstrong worked and believe it or not, um, it's still exactly the same. It's still a solicitor's office. It has his old brass plate heavily polished up on the wall and in his office where he was originally arrested, there's his desk and his chair and his revolving chair still in the same place as a um, hundred years ago. And uh -huh. uh, that, you know, not changed in the slightest. So that was quite moving, actually. Very strange and slightly eerie. I can imagine. Yeah, it's good that they've preserved it. Well, it, 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 is, it is a working office. So the yeah. solicitor who, who has it now, um, he actually said, I don't use the chair because I'm too tall to use it. And it's quite uncomfortable. <laughs> of course, Major Armstrong was five foot six. This bloke was over six foot four. Yeah. So you can imagine um, <laughs> he'd uh, put it to one side but um yeah it's still there still in situ from the day that uh, scotland yard burst in on him one saturday morning on december the 31st 1921 new year's wow. eve and said we've come to ask you some questions and he'd been planning an afternoon's gardening so he was in his gardening clothes he'd uh, had breakfast at home said goodbye to his children and never saw them or his home again. Wow. Just went into work and got arrested and put on trial and eventually a few months later ex executed. So a hundred years and a month to the day of this recording, because we're recording it before we're, we're publishing, we're on 31st of Jan at the minute. Wow. Do you find that, because obviously the podcast is far, far more minuscule than writing a book, but do you find the most time consuming part gathering the research and how hard do you find it turning what you've researched into a readable book? Cause I've the difficulty I find sometimes is translating what you've found out into for me, a readable script. So is it quite a challenge to turn your research notes into a novel? Not I keep calling it a novel, beg your pardon, a book that people can read. Yes, but it's on a, larger scale than doing what I've done for the last 40 odd years in journalism. You research, you write down and then you type up. So it's more complicated and more detailed and obviously much longer, but the principles are all the same. Do you finish the research in full before you start writing? No, I didn't in this case because, part, well, a couple of reasons really, partly because of the lockdown and knowing that I would probably have to make use of books I bought or online sources. The various newspapers of the time are available in, in archive form. So I could do quite a lot 
but I was aware that, that in order to get the book out in time for the centenary, I had this May deadline and I knew that I had to get it done. So I couldn't uh, leave it until I'd actually gone out and about because I didn't know that that would be possible for most of the time I was writing it. Yeah. Wow. Well, I did ask my listeners if they had any questions for you. I got a couple back. I was hoping for a bit more, but never mind. <laughs> the first question I got, they were both on Twitter, actually. Uh, the first one is from user AD Taran. I'm not sure what the AD stands for. It says, did you find in your research of this case that women use poison more than men as a murder weapon? And if so, why? Well, the Victorians thought so. And it was because they thought women had less strength, so they couldn't batter a man to death, but they could butter him to death with poison on his, on his food. And that was, again, insidious. It wasn't what uh, the Victorians thought those gentle souls could uh, or should be doing. In general terms, and I don't have the facts and figures exactly on my, at my fingertips, in general terms, men murder more often than women do. And especially now, poisons aren't readily available. I guess um, it's quite likely that uh, um, men battering women are more likely to commit murder than uh, women themselves are. That makes sense, I think, especially if the women feel that they couldn't outpower a man. It's yeah. a bit of a... It's also quite a more a powerful way of, of killing someone, I think, rather than a heat of the moment attack, sort of slowly poisoning someone and seeing them deteriorate. It's very definitely murder, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. um, it's something you have to do very deliberately. It's not something that is a spur of the moment uh, activity. Absolutely. The second and final question I have for you, Steve, it's from Rose Bundy on Twitter. They want to know how you did at school whether you flourished in English or whether it was something that you developed as you got older and through practice, I suppose, or were you a gifted writer, naturally? <laughs> well, I was always very interested in writing and reading because I was a great reader as a child in those far off days before um, websites and uh, online and electronic media and all that. Um, so, yes, I, I was interested in writing. I enjoyed writing from an early stage and um, obviously developed when uh, I got older through O-levels in those days and A-levels and getting into university and uh, so on and so forth. We had to write weekly essays. And um, so that sort of started to hone my literary skills and ambitions, such as they were. And then journalism, the need to write concisely and to rewrite very quickly also were, was a, quite a powerful discipline. And I enjoyed the challenge of that, knowing that you were writing something that potentially hundreds of thousands of people would be reading within hours. Uh, it was a bit daunting, but um, exhilarating as well. And that's the buzz that I got from journalism as well. Yeah, I was going to ask then if you preferred writing to a deadline rather than with no end date. But that, I think that pressure brings the best out of people, typically. Well, it, 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 can be quite, uh, it can be quite daunting. A lot of people wouldn't want to do it. But if you know that you have to get a story done within a given time and to get it... Um, published within the hour or within an hour and a half or something then certainly yeah it uh, concentrates the mind and uh, you have to focus quite uh, quite directly you don't have time by and large for second thoughts you have to go with it and there are various templates and ways of constructing a story which help you into that fast delivery mode doesn't always work but um with experience you know how to frame a story and you know what you want to say in a story and then away you go lovely 
So before we uh, sort of close out, Steve, there's a few, well, three questions I ask all my guests. It's sort of a quick fire thing. Don't overthink it. First one, do you have a motto or a philosophy that you live by? Oh, gosh. No. Uh, apart from the golden rule, which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. My wife is religious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started your career? I'd like to have known the various turning points in my career in advance so that I could prepare for them and um, accomplish them perhaps better than I, I managed to do at the time. Okay. And finally, if you could go back in time and change something, would you and why, if the answer is yes? No, I don't think I would change things because I don't think that oh, one person by and large can change the course of events. And it's not entirely desirable that uh, that should happen. People make their own mistakes and uh, learn from them over time. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask at the start of the, the chat, I forgot to ask you, what's the, in your opinion, the most interesting article or story you've worked on throughout your career? Oh, golly. Um, well, I spent a lot of time covering politics and my last job on the paper was covering royalty. So I suppose one of the most interesting cases was the whole Princess Diana saga, which was um, something that I covered on and off for about 10 years by the time the uh, inquest verdict was uh, was gained. Um, people always thought, in the certainly on the tabloid press, I was on the Guardian by that stage, but the tabloid press assumed that when Diana died so tragically, that was the end of someone who'd been a great money spinner for them. All you had to do was put the latest image of Princess Diana on the front page and you could watch the sales grow people thought well now she's died that's the end of that but actually it went on and still does you can still pick up a copy of the daily express some days and uh, she's still there 25 years after her death a phenomenal experience and uh, a very strange and tragic and long drawn out story Certainly a sad one. I know my mum was very, very upset when it happened. Was it 1997? 97? Yes. Yes, yeah, 97. Yeah. So I'd, I'd have only been eight by then. Oh, goodness. Oh, you do make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that one in there. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, let's just reiterate then. So April 7th today, published day of this episode, The Poisonous Solicitor, The True Story of a 1920s Murder Mystery by Stephen Bates. I'm going to put a link to your website in the description of this episode do you want to just give a shout out about where people can find you anything else you've got coming in the pipeline yes i've, I've got a, a completely different sort of book coming out later in the year which is a, a short history of the british crown and it's called the shortest history of the crown uh it's not about a television series it's <laughs> about the evolution of the monarchy in britain because as you heard me say i've uh, I covered royalty for The Guardian for 12 years at the end of my career. Lovely. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish, Steve? I would just, I, sh I should have mentioned it earlier. Uh, one of the most tragic and poignant uh, things about uh, the Armstrong case was that, um, as I said, he walked out on um, New Year's Eve and never saw his three young children again. And of course, once he was executed, there was a question of what to do with these three innocent children, one of whom was a teenager, the youngest of whom was only five years old. And they were eventually put into care and uh, fostered. And certainly the youngest one wasn't allowed to know anything about what had happened to her parents. They were. She was told that uh, her mother had had a stomach complaint and that her father had died falling off scaffolding, if you can believe that. Wow. The foster parents who took her in in Wales 
didn't allow her to have any photographs of her parents, any letters from her parents. They even tore out the page of her Bible that had been given to her at her christening, which her father had written on. And she, the story goes, where, how true it is, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a, an awful, extraordinary story, that she first discovered about what had happened to her father when as a teenager 10 or 15 years later she went on a school trip to Madame Tussauds and came face to face with him in the Chamber of Horrors. Wow. You can imagine that. That is that is a shocking story isn't it? And she lived until only a few years ago, died as a very old lady, still convinced that her father was innocent and that he'd been wrongly executed. Wow. But uh, that is uh, a very sad outcome and it's one that it's very difficult to cover with any sort of equanimity. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a really fascinating story. I'm excited to read the book. Hopefully my listeners pick it up as well. The Poisonous Solicitor out now April 7th. And I'd just like to thank you for coming on, Steve. Appreciate you giving me the time. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. I've enjoyed it very much. Lovely. Thanks for asking me. Not a problem.